will slowly start. Uh, so uh, warm welcome on behalf of the uh, virtual environmental ergonomics series organizing committee uh, to today's session, which will uh, resolve around attitude and hypoxia in per with particular reference to cognitive function. And we are very pleased to host uh, two speakers today, in particular, Kate O'Keefe and uh, Joe Costello. Uh, before we start, uh, I would obviously just like to say a few words uh, in terms of the uh, seminar, the session, and uh, how uh, we will execute it today. Uh, so if you remember the virtual environmental ergonomics webinar season, uh, sessions started uh, in, in a way in a response to a pandemic, a crisis uh, which has engulfed us for the last two, two years or so. Uh, but it's also worth mentioning that currently we're also in another crisis. So uh, our hearts obviously go out to our Ukrainian, Ukrainian colleagues uh, and uh, the people of Ukraine who are currently under attack. Uh, we all, I guess you all know that uh, there's also quite a strong environmental uh, scientific community in, uh, in Ukraine. And in, in the on the topic of today's session, uh, I would also especially like to mention um, my dear colleague, uh, Professor Tatiana Serebrovskaya, who is the, uh, the lead researcher in Bogomolets Institute of Physiology in Kiev. So we all obviously hope that uh, they're holding well they're staying safe, and uh, I think each of us should try and do what we can to help um, the Ukrainians uh, at this stage. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the virtual environmental ergonomics sessions, we know that now we're in the third season. This is the famous Wall of Fame for the first season. We've hosted a number of uh, great speakers on various topics of uh, environmental physiology. Uh, we've went from uh, weekly meetings to twice per month meetings, and now we're holding them monthly. Uh, and all the, the previous sessions are available for uh, watching uh, on the Environmental Ergonomics YouTube channel, and also their uh, student uh, in instructor guides, which can be accessed by um, uh, students or lecturers and used during their courses, which are available on the, on the ICE uh, web page. I'm really also very happy to tell you, which uh, the, it was announced on the previous session, but that we will also hold uh, the uh, in-person meeting after a bit of a delay in Niagara Falls in Canada. Stephen Chung is the head organizer and he's been working hard on getting uh, uh, this thing up and running. So uh, it will happen between September 6th and 10th, uh, uh, 2022 in the beautiful Niagara Falls uh, in Canada. No, it will not only be focused on science, but there's much more that the area can offer. Uh, you can you see the, the context here. You can contact Stephen directly or via the Gmail uh, here. And the website should be up and running soon uh, with registration and all the, uh, the pertinent information available soon. So I really hope that we manage to see uh, each other in person in the beautiful um, uh, Canada region. Uh, so for today, as I mentioned before, uh, we have two talks. First will be uh, Joe Costello, who's the Associate Head of Research and Innovation at University of Portsmouth, who will give us an overview of hypoxia, uh, cognition and performance and cognitive factors affecting performance. And the second speaker will be uh, Kate O'Keefe from University College London, who did her PhD in Lavra on the psychological factors impacting performance and hypoxia. And her work from that PhD will uh, be the topic of her presentation uh, uh, mostly. So uh, if you should you have any questions during their talks, you can obviously use the Q&A feature uh, and post your questions. We will hold a short um, short uh, Q&A after each talk, but then sum it up in the end with a general uh, general discussion. So uh, more to please uh, engage uh, with the um, with the speakers. Uh, they, they will also be able to answer you live in the in the Q&A feature or uh, during our Q&A session. Uh, so with that, 
uh, I would I will stop sharing my screen and we'll give the floor to Joe. Joe, here you go. Uh, thanks, Tare, for that introduction. Uh, and thanks also to, to yourself, Stephen and Chris, for the, the invitation to attend and, and present some of the research from our laboratory uh, today. Uh, it really has been a, been a great seminar series that you three have put on, uh, and I've certainly been following it, and it's a great resource for students. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be uh, partaking today. So as Tade said, I'm uh, Associate Head of Research Innovation and I'm based at the Extreme Environments Laboratory in the School of Sport Health and Exercise Science at the University of Portsmouth. Uh, I'll be talking uh, today about hypoxia uh, and cognitive performance. And after me, uh, Kate will, uh, will be talking. It's kind of, I was saying to the guys at the start, it's kind of ironic that two Irish people uh, are talking about hypoxia, considering how uh, Ireland is such a, a low-lying country, but, but anyways. Um, so I suppose a little bit of a, a background first. We know that millions live, work, compete and travel to high altitude. Just a, an interesting stat from uh, some research a couple of years ago suggested that about 400 million visits are made annually to about 6,000 ski areas and resorts. And while the physiological effects of altitude on, on humans and human performance is relatively well established, the effects of hypoxia and cognitive performance are relatively less well understood. And that's something our group have been uh, looking to address uh, and investigate over the last number of years. Um, and this is a, a paradigm or a descending spiral, as we call it, that we published a couple of years ago in an editorial in experimental physiology with Professor Mike Tipton and Dr. Matt Wilkes. And we focused on, on high altitude or, or low FiO2, but really this paradigm could be translated or could also work for a variety of other clinical conditions, including hypo or hypothermia. So upon exposure to any type of environmental stress, such as low FiO2, uh, we see a physiological cascade and typically uh, some of the uh, cascade goes to the level of the brain where we see impaired oxygen mitochondrial uh, oxygen uh, or impaired uptake of mitochondrial oxygen and a non-uniform reduction of, of oxygen across the brain. This will then likely lead on to dysregulation uh, of uh, brain networks and potentially impaired neural connectivity across various and multiple brain regions. And this is likely to lead on to some sort of impairment or reduction in cognitive performance. But unfortunately, and probably worrying, we know multiple historical examples of where this is not the end of the loop. And we see a descending spiral where in these scenarios where there is a, a, a cognitive impairment or a, a reduction in cognitive performance, people often potentially increase their risk-taking behaviors and this cycle or this spiral continues. So this is, uh, I suppose, the rationale behind some of the work uh, that we're doing at the moment. So a few years ago, uh, in I suppose the, the start of our work in this space, we um, sought to investigate uh, the acute effects of hypoxia on cognition and cognitive performance. And this is work led by Professor Terry McMorris, who's an adjunct professor at our institution. And we completed a, a thorough systematic review and meta aggression on all the, the literature that was published in this space. And perhaps surprisingly, we were um, a little bit surprised to see that only 22 studies had been published uh, on less than 450 participants examining this. Uh, hypoxia did indeed uh, impair and reduce cognitive performance, but this appeared to be irrelevant of whether that exposure was hypobaric or normal baric in nature. And it appeared to be that the low uh, or the PAO2 was the key um, predictor of the cognitive performance. Some other findings that came out of that systematic review was that it was a, a very limited evidence base, both in terms of the quantity and indeed the quality of the, the studies. 
there's quite a significant uh, ambiguity surrounding the type of task or tasks that were impacted or affected. And again, perhaps surprisingly, many of the studies lacked a normoxic or a controlled con condition. The majority of the studies were pre-post design um, and didn't really have a good comparator. Uh, again, majority of the studies, almost all, really lacked a mechanistic insight in an attempt to explain why there was an impairment or reduction in cognitive performance. And on top of this, the majority of the studies only focused on a single stress or hypoxia. But we know that hypoxia is rarely experienced in isolation. It's often experienced uh, alongside other stressors, be it fatigue, exercise, cold, etc. So from here, we sought to examine cognitive performance during exposure to a range of mild to moderate normal baric hypoxic exposures. And this is work uh, that was published in Experimental Physiology a couple of years ago uh, by my PhD student, Tom Williams. And I'll talk to, I suppose, some of the hypotheses in our findings now. So we hypothesize that performance of more complex central executive tasks would be more susceptible to hypoxia. And we further hypothesized that this cognitive performance would be correlated with changes in SpO2, uh, cerebral oxygenation, and plasma adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, and copeptin. So I'm just going to talk you through uh, the design and, and the methods. Um, so we utilized a single blind, that's a participant blinded, uh, randomized control design. So the participants were unaware unaware of the uh, environmental condition that they were actually partaking in. We did a thorough health screening uh, involving a 12 lead ECG and a full blood count, um, thorough familiarization of all the tasks, which is very important in any uh, cognitive performance related study, uh, and four experimental trials. And each experimental trial uh, revolved around 60 minutes exposure in a thermoneutral uh, condition, and the participants were in a, a semi-reclined uh, position throughout. There was at least a, a two day washout um, period between each trial. And as you can see here, the conditions were an FiO2 of 0 0.2093, 0 0.17, 0 0.145, and 0 0.12. So altitude equivalent of from sea level up to approximately uh, 4,300 meters, but it was, uh, as I said, a normal barrack uh, exposure. Some of the tasks that we were interested in, we used a battery of tasks. We used a simple and choice reaction time, which are generally considered non-central executive tasks, uh, measuring general alertness and motor speed, where either a, a single or multiple stimuli were presented uh, to the participant and they had to respond as quickly and as accurately uh, as possible, as you can see here uh, in the diagram. We also uh, use the Ericsson flanker task, which is a central executive function task, and it typically measures inhibition and selective attention. And you can see here in the top, you have a congruent trial, um, and in the bottom, you have an incongruent trial. And the task is to correctly identify the direction of the middle arrow, either left or the top or right on the bottom, where you have distractors. Uh, we also uh, assessed working memory performance uh, using the, the MBAC, specifically the three back. Uh, again, another central executive function task. Uh, and here participants had to correctly identify uh, a letter that was presented to them uh, three times previously. Uh, we measured a, a range of physiological variables, including cerebral oxygenation measured via NEARS, SpO2, uh, various carrier risk. Um, variables. Uh, we record blood before and after each of the trials, and also perceptual measures, uh, breathing difficulty, mood disturbances, uh, and any acute mountain sickness. So I suppose um, by design, and as expected, we saw a concomitant decrease in SpO2 as the severity of the hypoxic trials uh, increased. So where the lower uh, FiO2s, we saw the lowest SpO2s. And in the 12% oxygen condition, it equated to around uh, an average of 80%. Uh, similar data was also uh, reported for the cerebral oxygenation, uh, and specifically uh, the tissue saturation index, which reduced about 7 or 8% after the, the most severe condition uh, and 60 minutes of exposure. 
So the simple and the choice reaction tasks were not impaired, nor was the uh, Ericsson flanker. The only task that showed an impairment was the INBAC trial. And here, I suppose, just to orientate everybody on the x-axis, I have the different conditions, the different trials, uh, the uh, normoxic one, 17% O2, 14.5 and 12 uh, on the right-hand side. And all these data are individuals and means and standard deviations. Uh, this is the accuracy of the performance. And as you can see, it was only in the 14.5% and the 12% trials where we saw a significant reduction in cognitive performance, not in the 17% trial. So this is change uh, uh, within day. So this is change from baseline to post 60 minute exposure. And as expected, there was no change uh, in the normoxy controlled condition. Um, because of the relatively mild to moderate hypoxic dose, and because the duration was only 60 minutes, um, although there was significant inter-individual variability in the plasma biomarkers, there was no significant increase in any of the sympathodrenal or HBA access uh, markers that we were looking in. However, and interestingly, what we did find was a significant correlation between the change in SpO2 and the in back the working memory performance. So as SpO2 uh, reduced, uh, accuracy also reduced. So on the x-axis here again, we have the change in the SpO2, and on the y-axis, we have the change in accuracy. And similar data was also found for reaction time. So those with the lowest SpO2 tended to have the, the slowest reaction time. Um, for the first time, we were also able to show, this has been speculated quite a lot in the literature, that cerebral oxygenation is likely to play a role. However, very few had actually uh, examined it. So we were able to demonstrate the TSI. So this is the change in oxyhemoglobin uh, divided by the change in total hemoglobin expressed as a percentage. So again, the largest reductions in TSI uh, were correlated with the largest reductions in accuracy and the opposite for reaction time. So those with the lowest uh, TSI tended to have the slowest reaction time. But I suppose, um, as I mentioned earlier, hypoxia is rarely experienced in isolation. So what we uh, considered in some work that we've published with a long-term collaborator of mine, Professor Suichi Ando in Japan, was wondering what happens when exercise is combined or completed in a hypoxic environment. So this is a, a diagram um, that we generated based on uh, the existing evidence looking at the interaction between physical uh, uh, exercise and the detrimental effects uh, of hypoxia. So it's relatively well established that moderate intensity exercise improves cognitive performance. And similarly, as I've talked earlier, that hypoxia uh, is likely to impair cognitive performance. And both of these stressors uh, activate various neural um, um, sites, including neurotransmitters, cerebral blood flow, and cerebral metabolism. And the question is, when you perform exercise in hypoxia, does this result in an improvement or actually an impairment in cognitive performance? The findings were a little bit convoluted, and it was one of those not a clear yes or no. It was a it depends, um, and it really depended on the exercise intensity and the duration of the exercise, but also the severity and the duration of the hypoxia exposure. So the, the findings tended to suggest that if the exercise is of moderate intensity for at least 20 minutes and the severity of the hypoxia was not too much and for not too long, then it typically resulted in an improvement in cognitive performance. However, if the hypoxic stimulus was very severe, or even the exercise intensity was very severe, um, then it was likely to uh, observe an impairment or a reduction in cognitive performance. So with that in mind, we saw, set out to do another study looking at the isolated and combined effects of hypoxia, sleep deprivation, and exercise. So why sleep deprivation? And I suppose we could have, and we did consider multiple stressors, but 
for those of us who have spent any time uh, at altitude or even gone skiing, one of the first things you will notice is that your sleep is impaired. And this is uh, possibly due to travel and also the physiological stressors that you're uh, being exposed to as well. Um, and it's relatively well established that uh, sleep deprivation in and of itself can impair cognitive performance. However, to date, there's very limited uh, understanding or knowledge of what happens when hypoxia and sleep impairment or reduction are, um, uh, are collated or, or happen together. So we had uh, an experiment where individuals undertook a full night of sleep and in a randomized controlled crossover design, they also completed one night of complete total uh, sleep deprivation where we got them in the lab and kept them up all night. Then using a similar normal baric hypoxic uh, stimulus as I've previously talked to, we looked at these stressors in uh, isolation and in combination. Thereafter, we superimposed third stressor exercise to see if we could potentially ameliorate some of the decrements in cognitive performance that we would expect to observe. So the, the hypothesis of this particular study were that cognitive performance will be impaired after the isolated and combined effects of hypoxia and overnight sleep deprivation while at rest. The second hypothesis was that moderate intensity exercise would ameliorate any declines in cognitive performance. So using a similar design as what I've previously talked to, uh, we used a randomized control crossover design. So the people who did the sleep deprivation first came, uh, did, the, um, uh, did the full night of sleep second, and then half the group did the opposite. We recruited 12 healthy um, male participants. Similar, they went through a thorough health screening, familiarization, and four experimental trials. There was a minimum of seven day washout between uh, the sleep deprivation or the control conditions. And the exercise consisted of at least 20 minutes uh, of an RPE of 12. The FiO2, um, again, it was normal barrack, was 12%. Um, so this work, uh, again, is uh, some of one of my PhD students, Tom Williams' work, and we we'll currently have the data uh, um, just collected, and we're putting this into preparation as we speak. So I'm going to talk to the results of um, just one task, but we did a battery of tasks, and they're all quite similar. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll just continue in the vein of the in-back performance, which is working memory. So to orientate people uh, on the x-axis in, so this is the normoxic control condition uh, when people had a full night of sleep. The H is uh, hypoxic, again, in the control condition where they had a full night of sleep. NSD stands for, uh, uh, so it's normoxic sleep deprivation, and then the HSD is the hypoxic sleep deprivation. On the y-axis is throughput, so throughput is a measure of cognitive efficiency. So it's the number of correct responses uh, per time uh, when they're doing the task. And as you can see here, in particular, the sleep deprivation uh, uh, resulted in a significant difference compared to the normoxic control condition. But this wasn't different whether the people were hypoxic or not. So sleep deprivation was the, the primary stressor in this perspective. So that was at rest, those data are at rest. Now what happens when we introduce exercise, moderate intensity exercise on top of this? So again, uh, on the y-axis, this is the change in throughput performance and the deltas here are from the normoxic resting control. And you can see when people are sleep deprived, there is a, a, a significant reduction in their performance. But when we complete the tests after 20 minutes of exercise, we were able to restore uh, that performance back up uh, close to baseline. This is when people are sleep deprived and hypoxic. Again, you have similar uh, reductions uh, while at rest um, from the normoxic control condition. But despite these participants being in a hypoxic state and completely sleep deprived, once exercise were introduced, we were able to restore that performance back up uh, to baseline levels, as you can see here. 
So I suppose the, the conclusions um, from the work that we've done in our lab and that we're, we're continuing to do is both hypoxia and sleep deprivation appear to impair cognitive performance. Moderate intensity exercise uh, appears to ameliorate uh, these impairments. But I suppose similar from a physiological perspective, the majority of inter-individual variance in cognitive performance following exposure to hypoxia remains unaccounted for. And the final, I suppose, take home message here is something that we've uh, mentioned in our recent editorial in, in experimental physiology. Collaboration with multidisciplinary teams is, is needed to close this kind of complex loop between physiology, cognitive performance and behavior. And um, with that in mind, I'd just like to, to acknowledge and, and thank all, all the collaborators on, on this work um, that I've, I've, uh, I've shown you today. Um, a lot of it came from uh, Tom Williams, PhD, um, from colleagues, uh, some of whom I'm sure are very well known to in our own laboratory, some psychologists, uh, skill acquisition experts, medics and biochemists who've helped support this work. So uh, with that tie date, um, that's me done. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be happy to try and answer any questions you may have. Yes, thank you very much, Joe, for uh, uh, another obviously great, great presentation. Uh, so uh, let's go with two questions now, but the first one will be from me. So from the, the, uh, the factors that you investigated in this last study, only exercise was the one that could potentially improve cognitive function in a way. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, Tade, it's, it, that's correct. I suppose the, the one caveat there is we deliberately selected the intensity and the duration of exercise to try and elicit an improvement in the decrements that we observed. So I can't I'd, I'd only be speculating to say if we change the intensity or duration of exercise, those results could swing in either direction very quickly. But we kind of a priori set out to see if we could restore the potential impairments. Um, so we deliberately selected the, the intensity and the duration, the moderate intensity exercise for at least 20 minutes to see if we could, um, I suppose, address some of those deficits that, that we expected to occur. Yeah, I think it's a great approach. And obviously, I mean, it's nicely to target, you know, exercise in that way. Uh, but if you were to want to uh, induce a significant decrement of uh, cognitive function in general, if you were to go with the severe hypoxia, deprivation and high intensity, long duration exercise, that would be the solution. Eh? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, I would expect that there's there's limited studies in that space because I suppose very high, uh, a very high hypoxic um, stimulus or uh, low FiO2, it's quite difficult to do high intensity exercise, certainly of long duration, um, but um, you would likely see an impairment, I would suspect. Yeah, definitely. And I, I must say, I mean, I'm not an expert on cognition, but when you look at all the factors and all the uh, different tests that can be influenced. I mean, it's a complicated topic to study. Uh, and now we have a, a really nice uh, question from Josh Foster, because they're not only uh, more of a clinical related one, and in particular, um, uh, he's asking about, uh, because in some cardiorespiratory clinical conditions, such as the COPD or heart failure, etc., so they are associated with reduced daytime SpO2, so meaning daily hypoxemia or systemic long-term hypoxemia. So are you aware of any literature or uh, studies related to the cognitive effects of this chronic hypoxemia long-term? And with that, if you think, or can you speculate if, if hyperoxia would ameliorate that? that effect. I think it's it's quite an applied question, I know, but... Uh... Yeah, it's uh, thanks, Josh. It's, it's a brilliant question. It's not one that's easy to answer, but I suppose there's a couple of key differences, certainly something we have considered and thought about. And like most environmental physiology research, there's always some link back into the medical slash clinical sphere. But the couple of key differences is um, this is this is acute, very acute hypoxia or that's, as you said, had a chronic kind of systemic long-term hypoxia. So there is a, a wealth of literature in that space showing, um, certainly compared to the general population, that there is lower cognitive performance and scores. But 
there's a number of covariates that also need to be taken in, including education, lifestyle, um, a whole host of um, different things, including activity status. So it's, it's definitely a really good question. Um, and the, the solution, that the hyperoxia, is certainly something that, that could be considered. Now, I'm not specifically sure of, of any studies looking at hyperoxic uh, um, in, uh, interventions in those populations, but um, I'll, I'll certainly look it up. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I, I would I tend to really agree with you. And also hyperoxia itself, you know, it's a double-edged sword in a way. So it's not always uh, the more the merrier. So it's uh, it's definitely something. But it's it's a topic that could be tested in a way in this population. You know, it's not uh, it's not impossible to address uh, scientifically. So Joe, thank you for now. We'll continue with the discussion later. And now uh, uh, we're giving the floor to Kate. Um, yeah. Thanks, Alec. Yeah, no problem. Is that okay? Can you see that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, uh, we see it nicely. So. Great. Well, thank you. And thanks to the organizing team for inviting me to present uh, as well today. So I'm Kate. Um, I'm going to present today on the psychological factors impacting performance in hypoxia. And this, all of this research that I'm going to present today was from my PhD, which I conducted in Loughborough University. And currently I am doing a postdoctoral uh, position at the University College Dublin in Ireland. So I'll start, I suppose. OK, so um, this is a, just a brief overview of um, what I'm going to do today, or cover today. So first, I'll just give a brief introduction into the psychological factors that have been um, explored already, and then a quick definition of some terms. Then I'll look at more in depth about the psycho psychological factors impacting performance and specifically on mental fatigue and anxiety. Then I'll have a brief chat about some psychological interventions that have been used in extreme environments uh, to help ameliorate some of the decrements that we're observing in hypoxia. And then lastly, um, some considerations. So, okay. So from a psychological point of view, an extreme environment is defined as one where the environmental stress has a dysfunctional impact on a person's personality and psychological well-being. And this research has been, or some of this research has been going on since the early 90s, and it has suggested that environmental stressors impact a person's psychological function first before affecting their physiological function. However, despite this research existing and this being suggested, limited research has investigated the impact of psychological factors on performance outcomes in hypoxia, uh, especially hypoxia, but also in, in other conditions as well. So just to move on to a definition of terms. Um, so Joe just pre previously talked about cognitive factors and I'm talking about psychological factors. So these two words are interchanged quite a lot. And whilst they do impact each other, they are slightly different in terms of the factors that are involved. So here's the kind of breakdown of both. So on the left, you have cognitive factors. So these factors are really focused on the neural processes which are governing behavior. So for example, attention, memory, language, um, decision-making, et cetera. Then on the psychological side of things, that's kind of focus on a person's personality and psychological well-being. So like mood, anxiety, motivation, personality, et cetera. So whilst they kind of seem separate, they absolutely are not. And they definitely do impact each other. More so, it kind of seems that psychological factors would impact cognitive factors more so than the opposite way around. But what I mean, or an example here would be, for example, if I'm in a highly stressful situation and I become anxious. When you become anxious, you have attentional alteration. So you might end up focusing a lot more on the negative outcome or um, the external factor that's causing the anxiety rather than the task at hand 
which then ultimately will impact your performance. So it is, um, they definitely are intertwined and it's important, I guess, to consider both when you are um, studying these, these um, um, factors. So now we'll take a, a look into some of the psychological factors that are specifically or have specifically been explored in hypoxia. So firstly, hypoxia does itself induce debilitating psychological impairment. And that has been shown in the form of mood changes. So some research has shown increases in depression, anger, irritability, frustration, and then euphoria. Um, then we have, have seen changes in anxiety, mainly increased anxiety at altitude. Uh, we also see personality alterations. So this has been shown to look like decreases in emotional control, increases in paranoia and obsessive compulsiveness behaviors. And then lastly, also mental fatigue has been shown to be prevalent in high altitude and as an increase in mental fatigue at altitude. So these are kind of the main factors that have been shown in the research so far, but their impact hasn't been explored, just them as occurring in hypoxia has been shown. So these psychological alterations are largely due then to the progressive reduction in the partial pressure of oxygen that we see when we, we ascend high altitude. And despite the known impact of these psychological factors on performance at sea level, and given their prevalence in hypoxia as a result of the hypoxia and the decrease in, in oxygen, um, research is warranted and has been, is limited to date on investigating the impact of these factors on performance in hypoxia. So to start off then, I'm gonna go into one of the, the psychological factors specifically, and that is mental fatigue. So the question I had um, when I started my PhD, there was a whole lot of research coming out on this topic at the time, um, all about mental fatigue and its impact on performance. So then I wanted to see, well, if mental fatigue is already inherent in these high altitude um, environments, does it actually impact performance in hypoxia? So briefly, um, mental fatigue is one of the most common causes of accidents and errors, and it is characteristic of high altitude occupations. And it manifests as a result of overusing the brain's available resources. And this leads to a reduced competence of the brain to undertake the cognitive workload efficiently. And previously it has been defined as a psychobiological state that's characterized by decreases in performance, loss of focus, decrease in motivation and mood alterations. So despite a lot of the research suggesting that mental fatigue does decrease performance, there really has been mixed results um, on whether or not it does. And this, this kind of mixed results could be due to um, the cognitive fatigue protocol that's being used to induce mental fatigue. So if we just quickly look then at what the current methods are or have been, um, they've often been single task tests. So tests that you do one thing at one time. They're non-individualized, which means that um, they're not individualized to each person's individual cognitive processing speed. And that's important because we do have different speeds that we process information at. So if some person who has a high proce processing speed receives a stimulus that's coming at a standard time, let's say 1.2 milliseconds, which is the standard time, that might be you know, completely under arousing for that person. So also they're of long duration, so up to about 90 minutes. And the control that these studies are using are often time-matched neutral documentaries. Um, and neutral is in, in commas there because what's neutral for one person might not be psychologically neutral for another. And lastly, they're used in a pre-performance style kind of routine. So you have your, your uh, mental fatigue test first, and then you have your physical or cognitive performance after. So my first question then was when I was going to actually do this research was, are these methods actually effective? And are the decrements then that, I've, or that we are seeing from mental fatigue on performance, are they an actual um, outcome of mental fatigue or are they due to psychophysiological states of under arousal? So I had two steps then to this research. Step one was to 
determine the most effective way to induce mental fatigue independent of other confounding constructs. And those confounding constructs could be physiological under arousal or sleepiness or boredom. Um, so I wanted to really isolate mental fatigue from these constructs first. So the aim then was to do that, to investigate the effectiveness of the current methods being used. And without going into a whole load of detail, because this is really just an overview of this study, um, the method that we used was a new testing paradigm, which included a dual task test. So you do two tasks at once, rather than the other previous tasks that do one test at one time. It's 16 minutes, so a lot shorter than the 90 minute tests, and it was individualized. So we had a familiarization session where we individualized the, the, this test to each person's individual um, processing speed. And then we compared this test to the standardized um, tests. Then some measures that we used, um, we monitored for physiological arousal, and we did that with heart rate variability and galvanic skin conductors. And then for psychological arousal, we had some questionnaires on sleepiness, motivation, mental fatigue, and mood. So just to have a quick look at what the tests look like. So previous research has used this first test here, which is called the AXCPT. So basically every time you see an X, you just press the space bar. So participants will be doing this at this standardized speed of 1.2 milliseconds for up to 90 minutes. But the new testing paradigm that we tested was, um, it's called the T load D back test. So time load dual back test. So there's two tasks you have to do at one time. So you have your numbers. So every time you see an odd number, you press the one, uh, one. And every time you see an even number, you press two. And then every time you see the same letter appear twice in a row, so it's a dual back test, you press the space bar. So, and that's individualized to each person's individual speed. So a lot going on. So definitely a much higher stimulating task than the standard test. So just to show you one um, physiological outcome of this, and I've just, I've cut this, this graph so it looks a bit weird, but to, to navigate you through it on the right, you have the galvanic skin conductance measured in micro siemens. And then these three bars, you have the AXCPT, which is the standard test that we compared to. Then we have the T load D back test, which is the new testing paradigm that we aim to test. And you've got a standardized version of that. So the same speed as the AXCPT, so 1.2 milliseconds. And then you have the individualized um, version and that was individualized to everyone. And when I say the stimulus, I mean how fast the numbers or the letters come at you on the screen. So that 1.2 milliseconds for the standardized, that means that they're coming at you every 1.2 milliseconds. So just to, to show you some of the results. Um, so you have highlighted there the individualized Tilo DBAC versus the um, AXCPT, which is that 90 minute standard test. Um, we found that using galvanic skin conductance, which is a measure of arousal, that the individualized T load D back had a significantly higher sympathetic activation than the AXCPT and the standardized version of the, the, the T load D back. So, overall, then, what this kind of means is that the 16 minutes individualized dual task test was the more effective method for inducing mental fatigue because it did this independent of sleepiness whilst maintaining that physiological arousal. So we were really able to isolate mental fatigue using this test. And key points and takeaways from this is that the current methods that are investigating mental fatigue and its impact on performance um, are using tests that are not independent of other factors like sleepiness, boredom, or under arousal. And then, so to induce mental fatigue, we should be using tests that are short in duration, the dual task, and they're individualized. So then after finding that out, I moved on to step two. So then using this test that we found to be most effective to then go on and investigate the impact of mental fatigue in hypoxia. So the methods then for this study, um, we had seven conditions. We had one familiarization session and six main trials and 15 participants. So we had two trials at sea level or um, so one, one with and one without mental fatigue. Then we had two at moderate altitude, one with and one without mental fatigue. And then we had one at high altitude, one with and one without mental fatigue. 
So within each trial, then you either had or you didn't have your mental fatigue test. So here you would sit for 16 minutes and do that T load D back test. Then you would go into the environmental chamber and you would perform the physical performance test, which was a 15 minutes time trial on the arm bike, followed by a 60 seconds maximum voluntary contraction of the right bicep. And that was accompanied by nerve stimulation to quantify central and peripheral fatigue. And then directly after that, we had the cognitive performance test, which was um, the Tower of Hanoi there, which you can't really see it, but essentially you have to transfer the five discs from pole one to, to pole three. OK, so then just to see some results here from the physical performance um, side of things on the top graph there on the left y axis, you have average power output in the bars. And then on the right y axis, you have oxygen consumption. And then on the bottom graph, you have voluntary muscle activation on the left y axis and then post exercise resting potentiated twitch on the right y axis. So in general, what this what you can see here is that average power output, voluntary muscle activation percentage and oxygen consumption were all reduced in hypoxia but mental fatigue had no impact on physical performance. Then if we move on to taking a look at the cognitive performance results on that Tower of Hanoi, um, overall here, both mental fatigue and hypoxia had no impact on cognitive performance. So on the left there, you had time, and on the right graph, you had moves, so the amount of moves that they took. So the key takeaways from this study was that hypoxia decreased physical performance, but not cognitive performance. And mental fatigue, despite being induced independent of sleepiness and under arousal, had no impact on physical or cognitive performance. And these results suggest that mental fatigue is a transient and low stress state, and that it is vulnerable to more dominant stressors like the physical stress at the neural processing level. So then um, we'll move on to the second psychological factor, so anxiety. So first of all, anxiety is a multidimensional factor and it has two forms, which are state and trait anxiety. So trait anxiety is a more stable personality construct and that is where a person possesses an anxious predisposition all the time. And then state anxiety is short-lived and reflects transitionary emotional state. So the symptoms can be both psychological and physiological. On the psychological side, you have worry, mood change, poor concentration, etc. And then on the physiological side, you have increased heart rate, sweat rate, hyperventilation, nausea, headaches, etc. So they're all the symptoms of um, anxiety. So what the research currently says is that generally it has been demonstrated that individuals with higher levels of trade anxiety do exhibit higher levels of state anxiety and this is what leads to decrements in performance and this research is at at sea level so and this is a result of individuals with higher trade anxiety detecting and processing threats through heightened attentional alterations and what that means is that when we do get anxious in a situation, we often tend to focus our attention on what that kind of external, external stimulus is, the worry, the thoughts associated with what you're going to do next, instead of actually on the task at hand and the performance that you're trying to achieve. So then in hypoxia, the research on anxiety on performance has demonstrated an increase in anxiety related medical incidents at high altitude. And this may be a consequence of limited oxygen to the brain and overlapping symptoms synonymous with hypoxic exposure and anxiety. Also, other research has shown that trade anxiety at low altitude is predictive of the development of severe mountain sickness at high altitude. And also that increasing state anxiety at high altitude is independently associated with the severity and onset of mountain sickness. So, just to go back uh, to what I said there, that some of the symptoms with anxiety are synonymous with the environments that they're in, and um, just to show you what this means. So in the heat, we have increased, and when we go into a hot condition, we have increased sweat rate, increased heart rate, some hyperventilation, 
mood disturbances and anxiety, which are all related to heat exposure. Similarly with hypoxia, we have increased um, heart rate, hyperventilation, mood disturbances and anxiety. And then with anxiety, we have also increased sweat rate, increased heart rate, hyperventilation and mood disturbances. So you can see here that all of the factors or all of the, the things that happen to you when you go into these environments are kind of interlinked and there's a lot of similarities. So the question is, if you're already an anxious person and you're experiencing these symptoms, if you go into a hot or a hypoxic environment, are the symptoms going to be exacerbated considering they're already uh, prevalent when you enter these environments? So that was the question that I had. And the next study um, that I did for my PhD was to kind of answer just that. So we did a study, it had a between groups design. We had a heat condition, temperate condition, temperate normoxic condition, and we had a hypoxic condition. Um, so we had 50 healthy male participants. We had one familiarization session and two main experimental trials for each um, condition. So one for, for heat, temperate, and hypoxia. Um, so then these are the conditions outlined. So in the heat group, we had the heat stress, so the environmental stress only, plus the environmental stress and the state anxiety. So we had that for each of the conditions. So the outline of the study was, um, I'm just seeing that that person looks like they're eating, but they weren't eating. That was just the setup where they filled out the forms. Um, then they performed cycling at 70% VO2 peak. Then they either did have or did not have the state anxiety protocol, depending on what condition it was. So the state anxiety protocol included mental maths plus an environmental deception. So every time a person got a maths question wrong, we deceived them by changing the, the condition, but it didn't really um, change. We just had a change on, on the big screen. So for example, in the hypoxic condition, whenever they got a maths question wrong, we pretended to increase the altitude by 100 meters. Um, and then it was the participant um, voluntary exhausted when, when, they, when they did essentially. So that was the approach call. Um, and some of the measures we, we took were subjective. So RPE, thermal sensation and thermal comfort in the heat only conditions and breathing discomfort in hypoxia only, state anxiety, mental effort. And then on the objective uh, measures, we had heart rate, oxygen consumption, oxygen saturation, cortisol, et cetera, et cetera. So some of the results show here. So this graph um, on the left, this graph represents time to exhaustion. So on the left, you have your time to exhaustion in seconds. And then on the bottom, you have your conditions. So SA there means state anxiety. So that's the environmental stress plus the state anxiety condition. So what this graph, shows us is that state anxiety, so in con essay, heat essay, hype essay, they, with the deception protocol, that condition reduced performance in all environments. So then if we take a look at um, some correlations here, um, in the heat, so in this top graph highlighted, so this is in the environmental condition only, so heat only, um, on, the, on the y-axis you have your time to exhaustion, and then on the bottom, you have your, um, your anxiety. So that 20 to 55, we recorded anxiety on what's called the STAI, so the State Trait Anxiety Inventory. So here, this represents the, the trait anxiety level that, that you have. So um, from this graph, we can see here that trait anxiety accounted for 35% of the variation in physical performance observed in the heat only. When heat and state anxiety or when state anxiety was added in the graph to the right of, of that graph highlighted um, we saw that there was no um, correlation between the trade anxiety and performance and worsen performance um, with the addition of state anxiety and then if we look at hypoxia um, so we won't go there yet um, the first graph here on the bottom left we have trade anxiety with just the environmental condition and we see no relationship um, between trade anxiety and performance. But then when state anxiety is added to the hypoxic condition, we saw that trading, that trading, that state anxiety, sorry, um, no, no, when trade anxiety accounted for 50% of the performance decrement. So I got muddled up there. So to say that again, essentially what we see in this graph highlighted is that um, 
when hypoxia is combined with state anxiety, so that deception protocol, trade anxiety was seen here to account for 50% of the performance decrement that we observed. So the key points to take away from that study was that state anxiety reduces time to exhaustion performance in the heat, hypoxia and temperate pneumoxic control. And um, trade anxiety is predictive of impaired performance in the heat independently, accounting for 35% of the variability in performance observed. And then when state anxiety is induced in hypoxia on top of the hypoxic condition, trade anxiety accounts for 50% of the impaired performance observed. So now we will move on to some psychological interventions that we've seen in hypoxia or that may be beneficial in hypoxia. So um, research investigating the psychological strategies so far, um, looking at interventions to help improve or mitigate the decrements observed in performance have largely focused on heat and the cold. So in hypoxia, there has been intervention, but it's mainly been focused on physiological mechanisms such as dietary nitrate supplementation, respiratory muscle training, and acclimatization strategies. So limited research then has investigated the potential impact of psychological interventions to aid in mitigating these performance decrements despite psychological impairment being characteristic of hypoxia. So just to quickly look at what's previously been done in terms of psychological interventions, like I said, they're mainly, they've mainly been done in the heat and very limited in the, in the cold. But in terms of the heat, we have motivational self-talk and that was seen to increase power output during a 30 minute cycling trial in 35 degrees Celsius. Then we have self-selected motivational music, which was also seen to increase total work um, over a 15 minutes cycling time trial by about 10%. And then we also had a psychological skills training package, which included goal setting, arousal regulation, imagery, and self-talk. And this package was seen to increase distance covered during a maximal effort run by 8% in the heat. Then similarly with the, with the same package of psychological skills training in the cold, um, that was shown to um, in, indicate an 80% increase in breath hold time in the, in the group that used this psychological skills training. So overall, you can see that there is quite a positive trend in using these psychological skills to, to improve performance. So I then wanted to go and see if there was one that I could, or we could use to, to help mitigate these performance documents in hypoxia. So I decided to go with potentially using self-selected motivational music as that intervention. So, the background here is that, yes, there does need to be more methods investigated to look at reducing the detrimental impact of hypoxia on performance. And self-selected motivation, motivational music has already been shown to improve performance at sea level and in the heat. And music does this by enhancing psychological factors like mood, emotion and cognition. And it does this by helping people to dissociate from effort and from pain. So the methods of this study was we tested the impact of self-selected music, motivational music on physical performance using the exact same physical performance um, set up in the, in the mental fatigue study. So there was a 15 minutes arm bike followed by a one minute um, maximum voluntary contraction. And we did that in two conditions in normoxia and, and, in, in, uh, and in moderate hypoxia. So we had 13 males for this study and they pre-selected their motivational music using the Brunel music rating inventory number two. Um, and the music in the music trials, that music was played from the very beginning of the 50 minutes arm bike right to the end of the one minute, one minute contraction. And just to point out as well, this music ranged from really, really slow um, church based music right up to, you know, the heavy metal, really quick um, stuff. So just to have a look at the results, then this graph displays average power output on the on the y axis and give your time there in minutes on the on the x. So um, what this graph shows is that average power output increased in the control and the hypoxic condition with the addition of music. So you can see um, the, the square the square the square line indicates music 
and the height music has the circle with the line going through it. So in both those conditions, um, average power output was in increased. Um, and then if we look at, at the voluntary muscle activation, um, we see here, well, just to talk you through the graph first, on the left way axis, you have your voluntary muscle activation percentage. And on the right, you have the right way axis, you have post-exercise resting potentiated twitch force. So what we see here in those two um, bars highlighted is that voluntary activation percentage was increased with the addition of music compared to the control and the hypoxic condition with no music. And this suggests that music increased the, the brain's ability to drive the muscle during a maximum voluntary contraction, sea level, and in hypoxia, and nomoxia and hypoxia. So the key takeaways from this was that music increased time trial performance and voluntary activation of the bicep by enhancing neural drive and diminishing detrimental mental processes, enhancing performance at sea level or in nomoxia and in hypoxia. And one thing I didn't show there was the subjective scores. So we, we um, also monitor discomfort, um, mental effort or PE, and none of those were impacted by, um, by hypoxia in the music and hypoxia conditions. Um, so that's what I mean by diminishing detrimental mental processes because um, there was no increase in discomfort or eff mental effort or uh, perceived exertion during those trials. Um, also, music acted as a dissociative technique where music blocked out the sensations of pain and fatigue, which further um, supports that subjective um, response. And then the results confirm that music is a viable intervention for mitigating the detrimental impact of hypoxia on performance. So lastly, just some considerations from all of this work. Um, when investigating mental fatigue, and it would be good to use or more effective to use methods which are dual tasks, so two tasks at one time that are individualized to each person's individual processing speeds and less than 30 minutes. Um, we also saw from this research that trade and stating anxiety do impact performance in hypoxia and may explain and have explained some of the variability that we're seeing. So potentially an important component to consider when conducting trials in hypoxia. Um, also, self-selected motivational music is a viable tool for mitigating performance documents in hypoxia. And more research into psychological factors that impact performance um, in hypoxia are warranted. And that is it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kate, for this great presentation. And obviously, I mean, uh, big congratulations for doing all this research work and packing it into 20 minutes now. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, a lot of work has been presented and a lot of really interesting interesting things uh, uh, developed out of this. So I have a few mi minor questions. So the first one is in the, I believe that that was the first study where you showed no effect of hypoxia on cognitive uh, uh, cognitive function. Do you, uh, Why do you think that was the case, that there was no effect? I mean, uh, do you have any explanation or? Well, what we kind of hypothesized was that it was more of a simple cognitive task rather than a complex task. And also it was post-exercise, immediately post-exercise. So there could be something at play with the post-exercise oxyhemoglobin response, but we didn't um, measure any, we didn't measure the kind of any brain hemodynamics or, or that kind of thing to actually monitor that. So um, we don't know for sure, but potentially that's why um, we didn't see an effect. Okay. And the other very interesting thing, at least for me personally, was, was the connection between uh, anxiety and uh, like pathophysiology of high altitude in terms of acute mountain sickness, etc. Do you think that that, that anxiety induces a uh, physiological effect, which then results in this uh, increase in AMS and stuff, or is it more related to the psychological factors that also influence uh, the perceived uh, kind of uh, acute mountain sickness, you know? Uh, yeah. Characteristics, yeah. It's a good question. And there is, from what I've seen, there is only that one study that actually monitored that. And it was, it's all subjective. So there was no physiological monitoring of why that might be that there is a heightened um, AMS scores. 
But if I was to speculate, I think it would be, you know, those physiological responses to anxiety anyway. So you have that increased heart rate, increased hyperventilation of hypoxia or of, of anxiety separate to hypoxia. If you do have an anxiety related uh, increase or um, even an anxiety attack in hypoxia, you do have that exacerbation of all those symptoms at once. So, I mean, I definitely more research needs to be done on that because there, there is barely any. So um, I guess that might be why, but I don't know. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think that this psychological aspect of uh, our expectations of going to hypoxia and expecting an effect is quite fascinating and definitely requires more work. And there was a nice paper by uh, Professor Barch in high altitude medicine and biology on that topic in terms of anticipation of these effects just recently. And it's really a uh, fascinating uh, topic. So uh, we have a question from Chad uh, Wiggins who joined us from the States. Uh, and he's wondering if you have any measures of minute ventilation during the exercise with the music. One thing that I've always thought about is the, uh, that outside of the motivational impacts of music, it can also mask one of the primary feedback mechanisms of exercise effort, breathing sounds. Also, what if you just remove the feedback by applying noise canceling headphones? Yeah, um, great question. The noise canceling headphones, um, I guess, yeah, you could potentially. So are you, so in terms of that question, you're, you're talking about if you don't have any music at all on and you just have those, those um, earphones on. Yeah, exactly. So I think that the idea is to eliminate the sound, also the sound of breathing, because it also okay. has a kind of a positive feedback on, on uh, ventilatory response to exercise. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's definitely a fascinating question. And like, I guess that's a whole other psychological aspect as well. Like if you if you're kind of picking up on different responses of your body like that, breathing rate or even sweat rate or all those different types of things. And, and you, you get anxious from seeing those, or you think that they're negative or whatever, like if you're, if that's your perspective on it, then of course that might, that might like in kind of decrease performance somehow, like um, related to that increase in different psychological aspects. But again, like fascinating area, but I don't know. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I also think it's a fascinating question in a way, uh, but uh, maybe on, on this topic. So why, 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 what made you choose music in a way? Because I was also fascinated when reading the paper. I mean, why, why music uh, as, a, as a strategy in hypoxia? Um, mainly because I had just, I was researching what psychological factors or kind of um, strategies have been used already. Um, and like you'd seen, there is not that many. There is the you know self-talk, arousal regulation strategies. There's um, whatever else, but motivational or self-selected motivational music was the one that had come up already to have an impact in heat. Um, and so I decided that maybe that might be a good place to start. But of course, there's so many other different factors to are psychological factors to also try and um, especially the psychological packages I think are, are really good um, but of course uh, then I also wanted to do one on its own to see the the impact of one on its own rather than a, a group as well so yeah it was just that it was no particular reason because again the, the research is completely lacking in, in that so um, it really was just just that yeah um, I, I exploratory investigation into the music effects yeah no i think it's uh, it's really uh, really fascinating and this brings us to the my applied question which i had for for both of you in a way is uh, so uh, we know that extreme environments can affect cognitive performance and let's say that you are a mountaineer going to high altitude and you would want to minimize the cognitive uh, you know, the, the, the reduction in the cognitive function because it influences your safety, decisions, moving, etc. So what, so I have a question for you, Kate, and for you, Joe, for you in terms of what can you do in terms of these psychological aspects, and for you, Joe, in terms more of uh, these cognitive uh, uh, aspects of, of that. Um, 
Um, in terms of psychological stuff, um, I think we're still at an exploratory stage in terms of what or how long it takes to, psych takes to psychologically adapt to, like, for example, if you go to train in high altitude. But from what's already out there, I would definitely say to use the or to monitor, to get a picture of this, the psychological profile of a person before they go to high altitude, like use these questionnaires, like the state train anxiety inventory, see if they what level of train anxiety they have before they go up to high altitude, because we already saw from the results I presented, if they have a higher train anxiety, they're likely to have a higher state anxiety and then worsened performance at altitude. And then maybe some other personality constructs, which we, we don't know yet if they impact um, at high altitude or if they exacerbate at high altitude, but other, other constructs like monitoring mood throughout or monitoring um, other things like you know, self-control or their, their mental toughness, these types of things that we know or we've seen before that do have impacts of overcoming um, adverse adversities in these environments. Yeah, so in a way like a pre-screening uh, to yeah. prevent uh, the same as as with the uh, physiological yeah. high altitude because i think that in this is in psychological terms for example you know uh, activities at high altitudes can present a real challenge and if if there's an anxiety present in general you know with different aspects not only environmental per se like uh, reduced pressure cold and stuff but also dangerous situation the unknown environment etc and can become a big problem so yeah and also they do just lastly they do have batteries of these tests that they do for like um selection for astronauts and selection for you know antarctica and things like that and they're very directly related to those environments like how you're going to cope in isolation team dynamics team cohesion all of that but this for particularly going to hypoxia to if you're going to perform or something like that you could use similar similar batteries but if it's focused on performance and an athlete going to train there or adapt and maybe something more specific to we need to do more to find to find this out but of course what i just said already like something specific like anxiety and monitoring mood change throughout um and mental fatigue might might help yeah, thanks a lot so joe what would be your suggestion yeah thanks for that. It's, a, it's a really interesting question i think that's I agree with everything Kate said, and it's probably very similar to the pre kind of selection tool or a, a preliminary before going to to such an environment might be uh, might be useful. But I'm always a little bit cautious of extrapolating work from the lab that's maybe kind of trying to isolate and identify mechanisms to um, actual terrestrial altitude, because you've got so many other variables at play. Um, that it's not always the, the easiest or most straightforward to do it. So I'm a little bit kind of slow to do that. And um, mainly uh, lab studies are trying to, I suppose, identify mechanisms and some of the work we've done looking at cerebral oxygenation potentially as a as one of the mechanisms which we, we're observing an impairment in performance and maybe uh, whether that could be used as a pre-screening tool or whether a particular intervention later on um, but it's, as you know, it's difficult to kind of translate the lab studies to the terrestrial altitude. Okay, thank you very, uh, thank you very much. I believe that uh, Chris and Stephen now have one question. Maybe Chris, uh, you can go first. Sure, thank you. Thank you both. Um, question for both of you, because obviously you've used simulated normoxic hypoxia. Just wondering, to, like, to, to following up from what today you said about expectations, I wonder whether you have any idea of how aware the participants were that they were exposed to hypoxia and whether that might have any impact upon their psychological or cognitive uh, responses. Yeah, so, I mean, the participants in our studies, are they, they knew that they were going to be exposed to hypoxia at some point, but the, the actual trials were blinded. Um, I mean, for the anxiety trial, we were just in, we were trying to induce state anxiety. So um, they knew that they were going into hypoxia. So that alone we were hoping was going to cause a stress on its own already. But then having that additional state stress where we increased, we pretended to increase the anxiety um, even more um, on top of a maths, stressful maths situation. We kind of wanted that additional anxiety in a way. Um, and then in the other studies, then they were blinded to the condition. So we're hoping that they remain blinded to the condition. Um, 
So uh, we're hoping to have, you know, that, that didn't affect us so much. Do you, do you know if they were or whether they had, you know, hyperventilation or something and so were aware that, did you, did you ask whether they thought they'd been exposed or not to altitude in that trial? Yeah, and it was always, um, you know, afterwards, like, what do you think? And it was always, yeah, definitely, or or no, didn't think so. You know, it was we didn't record that, but yeah, you're right, definitely could have been a factor. Uh, they definitely could have known that they were they were in it for sure. Yeah, uh, same from our perspective, and it's actually uh, an issue um, in in the broader literature in the space, Chris. That a uh, uh, blinding, particularly of the participant, is not always done. Um, particularly in the cognitive performance side. So we also, in our studies, blinded um, individuals to the environment they were in uh, and a similar did an, <clears throat> excuse me, an exit survey uh, to see if they could identify which environments they were in and nobody got it correct, um, certainly when they were at rest. Uh, and interestingly, we saw the, uh, because of the short duration, uh, hypoxic exposure, you wouldn't expect AMS to be an issue. Um, but in the normoxic uh, control condition, we had the highest AMS scores of one individual um, fully believed that they were in severe hypoxic state, uh, massive hyperventilation and really high heart rate. So I definitely think it has to be, um, it has to be a factor that is considered and, and shouldn't be underplayed the, the power and performance of that certainly in a, in a lab setting of individuals who are maybe naive to that type of environment or that type of environmental stress. Thank you very much, uh, Joe and, and Kate. Obviously, I, I think we can all agree that it uh, cognition, psychological and cognitive effects of high altitude are a fascinating topic. And even if we focus today a lot about the mechanisms and different approaches to counteract that, it has really many real life uh, implications, uh, safety, health, uh, rescuers, mountaineers, etc. So it is really, really an important topic. And uh, I would like to thank you again, both for uh, presenting, presenting your work. Before we wrap it up, I would just like to mention uh, that uh, we already have uh, the schedule for, the, uh, for our next session, which will happen on April 7th, when uh, Professor Andrew Lowering uh, and Carly Bradbury will um, talk about the uh, connection or the knowns and unknowns uh, of individuals with patent for Amanovales, PFOs, and thermophysiology, and which uh, this one promises also to be a, a great session. In the meantime, uh, don't forget to follow uh, our Twitter uh, advertisements and follow the announcements from Stephen regarding the uh, in-person uh, ICE conference, which will happen in autumn. So thanks again and uh, good luck uh, to everybody and keep safe and well, yeah?